Today we wrap up our eight-week series called Better Marriages. And if you're new to church or examining Christianity, we're also going to be giving you an opportunity to begin your relationship with Jesus here in just a few minutes. And today we're going to wrap it up with talking about blessed marriages. How many of y'all believe that God wants to bless your marriages? All eight of you. God bless you. All right. For those of you that did not have the decaf, all right, how many of you believe that God wants to bless your marriages? There we are. All right. That's the one that we'll use in the, in the footage later on. All right. So uh, in our text today, we're going to see that Jesus is talking his very famous message, the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. And he talks up. Uh, this is one of his most quoted messages. And he begins with talking about how to have a blessed life. And the best way, he he spends two chapters talking, hey, you need to work on developing your spiritual life. And so he's talking all that, and he's saying, hey, everything begins with your spirit first. By the way, I want to let you know, the quality of our life is determined by the health of our spiritual life. All right? The only limits on our life will be our intimacy with God and our daily disciplines. Okay? But on chapter 7... Jesus, all of a sudden, he switches gears in his message, and he begins, uh, he, begins uh, he wraps up the spiritual development part, and then he starts about talking about how to deal with other people, how to treat other people. And then he opens up with the most misquoted, misinterpreted uh, verse in all of Scripture that all of us have heard, maybe quoted and quoted out of context. Look at verse 1, it says this, Do not judge! Or you will be, or you too will be just. Judge not, Pastor Chad. How many times have I heard that one? I cannot tell you how many times that I've heard the scripture abused. And so many people who do not have a relationship with Jesus have misinterpreted this as Jesus commanding a universal acceptance over any lifestyle and any teaching. Well, judge not, PC. No, no that's not the case here. Keep on reading the verse because here's what we can always understand. There's a great principle in reading your Bible that all of us need to adopt. It's called this, Scripture interprets Scripture. So don't just take one and say, okay, that's it. No, no, you keep on reading, all right, because it's going to interpret one of those. Later on, we see Jesus in this passage saying that we can know ourselves and we can know other people by the fruit that we have growing in our lives. Uh, Whenever I was uh, pastoring in another state, very sweet lady came in our church. She came from a, a, a smaller church. Our church was really growing at the time. And uh, they'd had some changes in leadership. So she came over to our church. And she, uh, she in the first time, you know, they used to let me preach at, uh, at, at my old church. And I was like, oh, okay. And she kept on, like, hinting that she wanted to preach on Sunday morning and everything like that. And I just said, you know, I've got other staff that does this. And, you know, there's sometimes people who come in and uh, maybe, maybe some of us grew up at churches where people just let anybody just preach. That's not very smart, all right, especially as a pastor because they can cause you a whole lot of problems if you don't know who they are. The Bible tells us to know those that labor among us, right? And so this lady told me, she goes, well, Pastor Chad, I just want to preach and, because I'm an evangelist. And I said, you know, Miss Sister Mary, can I offer you a, a suggestion? Here's one of, one of the things that I've noticed. Apple trees, they don't wear a sign saying, hey, I'm an apple tree. You know what they do? They just produce apples. If you're an evangelist, you'll, you'll produce that, you know. And so uh, anybody that's, uh, that's called to preach, I'm like, okay, grow your small group first. Let me tell you something. You may not want to get up on this stage and preach, all right. Oh, I really would yeah, until you get up here. Them lights bring heat, all right? And so you can practice in a small group. Grow that small group. And if you're really called, I would encourage you to start off in the children's ministry, especially if you're called to preach. You know why? Because children will tell you if you can preach or not. They'll go, no, boring. I'm, I've watched them do it. They did it to me, all right? And so here's what you got to understand. That's what we understand. We judge fruit, Right? We're not judging people. Later on, uh, we see that uh, the reason why that Jesus is talking about this, the Pharisees and the religious leaders thought something wrong, that the more spiritual we get, the more we're allowed to judge, their, uh, to judge other people. And Jesus is rebuking that kind of thinking here. Look at uh, what, what you and I have to understand about what Jesus is saying here, that followers of Jesus are called to show unconditional love, but we are not called to give unconditional approval. Okay, so yes, we're called to judge, but we have to watch the spirit we're operating in when we do. Why? Look at the next verse. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. 
And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. All right? If we want people to analyze and criticize our every move, then you keep on doing it to them. And this is very important uh, right now because we're coming up into a very divisive time in, in the history of our country right now. All right? Quit judging people that you don't even know. You can judge the fruit, but don't judge them. All right? Uh, our, I was such a dumb husband the first couple of years. All right? Because, by the way, husbands, you do know that for the rest of your life, your main job will be proving to, your, uh, to the wife of your youth that you are not an idiot. All right? And there's nothing you can say about it. You're just going to have to constantly. So Jennifer from time to time would call me to remind me to do something, even when I was on my way to do it. And so uh, she would, uh, I remember uh, one time she called and she goes, hey, I just want to remind you, you got that meeting at 1 o'clock. And I'm like, I'm literally on the way in the car going to the meeting. And, and I just said, thank, uh, thank you. And all of a sudden I was like, I, I came this close to saying, and I want to remind you that I'm not an idiot. I've never missed a meeting. I've never been late to a meeting or anything like that. And I was sitting over there and I kind of spewing like, my God, why is she all the time calling me to do stuff like that? And the Holy Spirit checked me. And you know what he said? He said, Chad, Jennifer is your help meet. She is your helper. Let her help you. And so every time she calls down, I'm like, thank you for helping me, sweetie. You know, I, <laughs> and I'm checking my ego and she goes, that's what I'm called to do. All right. So here's what we got to understand. Jesus says, whatever measure or instrument that we use to judge others, the same one will be, judged, uh, will be used on us. Now, uh, last Friday, I turned 50. All of you guys uh, you know, uh, were, were so thankful, uh, so kind to me to, uh, to wish me a happy birthday. My little boy, all right? My little boy, he don't want no party. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm outgoing. I'm like, Evan, dude, you want people over at your house for a party. Guess what? More people mean more presents. You'll be, he's like, yeah, no, I don't want it. I'm like, what is the matter with this boy? No, uh, here's what, the, that's not love to him. You know what he wants to do? He wants him and his grandparents and his aunts and, uh, and his uncles to all go eat Mexican together, give them their parties there, and then all of a sudden, after that's over, he wants to go in his room for two days and not talk to nobody, all right? That's, <laughs> Now, for me, the bigger the crowd, the better the party. Why? Because that's my love language. It's not Evan's. We have to learn what the love language of our spouse is and give it to them the way that they need it when they want it. All right? So uh, we, uh, whatever measure we judge uh, people, we're going to be judged by. We judge when we only think the worst of someone. Do you know that? we got to catch people doing something right, even the people with whom we fundamentally disagree. I remember watching the news one time, and a particular uh, person in Washington did something that I agree. I said, there you go. Now you're helping me. You know, even though we vote differently, we think differently. Here's what we got to do. we gotta, we got to guard our spirits because everybody is dealing with something that we know nothing about. So we need, to, uh, we need to remember to be sensitive, but we also need to remember what Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote. He said this, every man is my superior in some way. If you and I see people as uninteresting, we'll mistreat them. But if we see people as interesting, and here's the other thing, endlessly complicated, okay? We will honor them and we'll see them as invaluable and irreplaceable. Because God has got relationships designed for us. We just got to be open. A couple of uh, weeks ago, I was at a, a minister's gathering, and I found my new buddy, okay? He is from Australia, all right? We, ha we both have accents. His is different than mine, all right? And he is a church planner. His name's Lunds, coolest guy in the world, all right? Lunds is planning a church in Chicago. He just got a building to meet in after hearing the word no 65 times. I'm like, I admire your tenacity. I'm like, send me a support letter, son. And so anyway, uh, we're sitting here, we're talking. And even though he's black, I'm white. He's from Australia. I'm from Alabama. We're sitting here, we're talking. We're like, oh my God, I think I've met my twin. We get off the phone with one another. Uh, we, we go and we're talking. We call our wives at uh, home that night and say, hey, look, dude, I, I, I've, I've met my twin. She, uh, uh, he said that to his wife. I said it to my wife. The next day I was like, dude, I listened to your sermon last week. And he goes, I listened to yours. 
We're sitting there talking, and I, I was like, okay, finally, here's the test to end all tests. I was like, I got to find something that we're different now. I was like, so Lunds, uh, what do you do to relax? He goes, it's really stupid pasta, Chad, what I do. And I'm like, well, tell me about it. He goes, I really enjoy barbecuing meats. And I went, oh, my God! <laughs> We're, we're sending one another pictures of the stuff that we smoke all the time. And so we're trying to get together. I'm sitting there thinking, in all my dad's years of travel, did he ever go to Australia? <laughs> because if he did, he probably needs to have a meeting with the family, all right? And so here's what I'm saying. Guys, the world, if you and I will treat people the way that we want to be treated. We're going to find more people that we can get along with and show the love of God. Don't be that guy. Don't be that gal that everybody, nah, 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 nah. no, come on, let's show the love of Jesus to people, all right? The, uh, another way that we judge is when we only speak to someone about their faults. Got to catch them doing something right, especially when you're raising, uh, raising your kids. We judge when we judge someone's life based on their worst moments. We judge because we fail to ask ourselves, I wonder if I'd have done the same thing if I was in their circumstances. We judge when we fail to remember that whatever measure we use will be used on us. Jesus is not prohibiting judgment. He's only requiring the judgment to be completely fair and the same one we judge ourselves by. And if we want to judge someone and are ignoring the exact same standard in our own life, we need to shut up about it, all right? The truth is, we often want to judge people because we don't want to be generous with people. We talked about generosity uh, last week. I love how Jesus uses the word measure here because this gives us a high motivation to be very loving and forgiving and good to people. You know why? Because we're selfish. We want the same thing for us. I'm going to be as sweet to you as all get out because I want you to be sweet to me too. And so here we see that if we want God to be generous with our mistakes, we need to be generous with other people's mistakes because whatever instrument we want to use will be used on us. Some of us are dealing, are using the wrong instruments in dealing with people because we think that yelling and raising heck and going off and cussing them out is going to work. And Proverbs helped me get free from that very early on in my walk with God because I was a hothead, all right? And still, that old Chad tries to come up, all right? He's still dead, but he tries to resurrect himself every now and then, all right? But you know what? I grasped a hold of a great truth in Proverbs uh, chapter 22. It says this, the rod of your wrath will fail. If you're a hardhead with people, it will cost us and it will cost our families. I was recently uh, reading a business magazine. It was talking about how uh, Apple Computer broke $3 trillion all right, in, uh, last year in the market cap, June 30th of last year. Did you know that one time in the mid-80s, Steve Jobs owned 20% of Apple, okay? When, but when he was ousted as CEO, in a rage, he sold off 99.9% .9 of it, held on to one share of stock so that he could still show up at shareholder meetings and give, give the business to somebody. When he returned to the company in 1996, the board incentivized him to be their CEO. They gave him 5.5 million shares. And when he died, sadly, he and his family were only worth $10.2 billion. All right. Probably want to send them some money. You know, God bless them. 10.2. How, how do you even live? And, but most of that was in Pixar uh, and Disney stocks. Now, here, why are you telling me all this, PC? Because if Steve Jobs had never sold 99.9% .9 of his Apple stock in a rage, his net worth and his family's net worth would be over $600 billion today. $10 billion, really good. But $10 billion, guess what? It ain't $600 billion. Ladies and gentlemen, why, why do I tell us all this? His anger costs his family dearly because the rod of our wrath will fail. Freaking out won't change anything. And one of the best things that I learned how to stop exploding in anger on people is to stop putting confidence in anger. Some of us, have y'all ever played out a scenario that hasn't even yet, and all of a sudden you're, you're like me, you're red-blooded Irish, you're, you're getting mad and ain't nothing happened yet. Like, so help me God, they say this, I'm going to say this. And I'm like, redneck, calm yourself down. What's the matter with you, freak show? There's nothing even happened there. And so some of us are mad before we ever even get there. And you're like, oh, well, this didn't go as bad as I thought. That's because we're, you're, you're stirring yourself up. Pray, uh, pray through. Freaking out doesn't change anything. Look at what Jesus says next. He says this. 
Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus is pointing out something very uh, important for us here. It's this. You and I, we are often far more tolerant of our own sin than we are of other people's sin. Have you ever noticed that the, we often judge the people that we are the most like? I've watched parents go off on their child so much. You go, I don't understand what them. I was like, they're just like you. You know who your children are? They're the unedited version of you. All right? And so I've watched so many. This one, he always tries me. And all of a sudden, you'll go back and you'll, I'll talk to the, the parent's parent. And they're like, that was just like him. It, it, that, there's not a time when, they, when he didn't talk back. You know, I don't understand why this child talked back. Well, you did. Yeah, you know, sometimes we get so frustrated with people that we're the most like. Jesus here is painting a very humorous picture here. Picture a person with a plank in their eye trying to remove a speck out of another person's eye. He is saying this, our hypocrisy is almost always more evident to others than it is to ourselves. And Jesus is, isn't saying it's wrong for help us to remove a speck from our brother's eye. It's good to remove the speck, but, but, uh, but before we do that, we deal with our own. All right? Now, it's kind of like one of the things that I say if, if we're going to be close friends, all right? This is the test for me. This is what I call the booger test. If I got a bat in the hanger and you don't tell me, we can't ever be friends. <laughs> if I walk around here with my, uh, with my zipper unzipped and a, and a booger in my nose and you don't tell me, I just didn't want to offend you. I'm like, okay, we're, we're never going to be. Now there's issues, all right? Somebody that loves me and like, PC, turn around here and zip up your thing and wipe your nose and stuff like that. Besties, all right? Here's what, it's, it's good to deal with, uh, with, with things to be able to help people. Here's what we got to learn before we address certain things, though. Patter, uh, problems are not problems. Patterns are problems. Sometimes people just have bad days. You ever notice that? There's a difference between somebody that's having a bad day and somebody that has had a bad life. Okay. Yeah, we give one another some leeway, and especially brothers and sisters in the Lord, we give them some time to let God address their bad attitudes and their insensitive comments, all right? And when we do confront, what we do is we do a self-check first, and then we lovingly explain that we see some unhealthy patterns, all right? Sometimes, you know, even, even on working on a team, something will, something will, somebody will say something, and I'll be like, all right, I'm, you know what, God will have to check them on that right now. It's not, it's not my time to be able to do that. And sometimes there'll be people like, you know what? I said this in a meeting the other day, man, it, it, it was, I, I, I didn't mean to say that. I'm like, dude, it's totally cool. You know what that tells me? They have a quiet time with God. All right. The time whenever we do have to address them, hey, I see some patterns here. And we'll lovingly explain. We do a self-check first. And here's one of the things that I've learned. And this is a maturity statement right here. If you and I will get better at confronting We'll spend a lot less time gossiping and complaining. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. There we go. All right. So sometimes there are some hidden issues behind the patterns. All right. I love it in his book, Trust, what Dr. Henry Cloud talked about this. He said this, trust rarely develops in judgmental people because there's just too much to overcome because most of what they see is imaginary. Too often, we prematurely judge people because we see old people in new people. And people, like for instance, people who have, who have had a hard time with uh, authority figures, you know what? Um, they will have authority issues until that problem is not only addressed but repented of and put into a process where they can learn change. When uh, we are struggling with trust, we need to ask ourselves why. Is there a pattern we've seen developing them? Or is it just something that stirs something up in us uh, that causes us to not see this properly? All right? If we can't see people properly for who they are, our ability to help them will be impaired because our issues are in the way. In other words, we have a log in our eye. And we can't help people when we have a log in our eyes. Embracing our issues... And finding the help that we need is the first step to growth and how we build trust. Jesus shows us here that before we ever address issues, we are well served to look at ourselves first. 
Okay? And not only that, we have to know who God wants us to help with these issues. Look at how, how this particular passage ends today. It says this. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn on you and tear you to pieces. Now watch this. Jesus is not saying, uh, not only, this is what he's saying. He is saying, don't be judgmental, but don't throw out discernment either. All right? Who are the dogs and pigs that Jesus is talking about? In this context, dogs and pigs are those who are hostile to the teaching of the kingdom of God and they reject the teachings of Jesus. He is saying this, uh, Christians, don't waste your breath going around trying to correct somebody's behavior who is not a follower of Jesus. The secular world is supposed to act secular. Okay? Being mad at people who are far from God for unchristlike behavior is like being mad at a cat for meowing. All right? It's just what cats do, and they're really good at it. Okay? Uh, and the context of the correction here is we only correct a brother or sister in the Lord. Why? Because the gospel only confuses those who do not believe. Yes, we need to share our faith with people, but we should be looking for people whose hearts are ready to receive. God has to prepare them first. So what do we do? We live it out, man. We're happy. We're joyful. We're generous. We are, we are salt among uh, uh, in the world that just seasons the gospel, getting people ready to receive it. Now, if you'd reach down in your chairs, I want you to take out your communion elements. And as you get all this ready, we practice at Coastal Church what's called open communion. What does that mean? It means you don't have to be a member of Coastal Church to practice communion. I went and visited uh, every year for, the, uh, uh, for a state championship game. I would go to our head coach's church. And they, they did communion at every service. And uh, he said, hey, um, uh, <laughs> they took communion real serious. They didn't practice over communion. And he's like, hey, thank you for coming. We're going to take communion you sit right here. I'm like, okay. We don't, we don't do that here, all right? If you're a follower of Jesus, please participate in this uh, with us, okay? Now, um, we just learned that Jesus always wants us to judge ourselves first so that we won't be judgmental towards other people. And he wants us to be closer to one another with him. And communion is another way that we do that. And before we take communion, what does Paul say we need to do before we take communion? He said, does he look at it and say, you need to go row by row and say, you don't need to take communion because of what you did last night. You know what you did. You don't need to take communion because of the way that you talked to your coworker last week. Is that what he said? No, no. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, we need to examine ourselves. He said, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. He's challenging us to go into communion with reverence and examination to prepare ourselves to have the right heart. Look at the next, uh, uh, later on in verse 29, it says this. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and also a number of you have fallen asleep. In other words, died. This is talking about corrective judgment, not eternal judgment. Because uh, what he's saying is that you and I are going to be judged because we didn't judge ourselves. Okay? Look at the next verse. He says, if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are also being disciplined that we will not finally be condemned with the world. So he's saying this. When you and I are observing communion, Lord's Supper together, the presence of the Lord is very, very thick. And when we're examining ourselves, what happens? We've got an opportunity to really open ourselves up to to some real healing and some, and some real, real breakthroughs in our life. But there's just some people like, you know, I don't care. I'm just going to take the communion and just, just get it over with. And Paul said, yeah, that's why some of y'all are sick. That's why some of y'all are dead. And so I remember one time a person comes, hey, this passage here, like God killed people with sickness there? I was like, no, no. The God of the Bible is never going to put sickness on people. Do you know why? Because the Bible, uh, God of the Bible doesn't have sickness to give. All right? If it's sickness, it's from the devil. What's happening is the moment is so pure and it's so awesome and it's so powerful that you and I, if we, were, if we remain just stubborn, not going to do any type of self-examination at all, then guess what's going to happen? We're going to get sicker and sicker and sicker and we're never going to live out to uh, what God really called us to do. 
All right? The word communion is a combination of two words. It means common union. And when we take the elements, we aren't just committing to being in a close relationship with God. We're committing ourselves to being in, a, in, a, in fellowship with all of God's people. When we take communion, we're recognizing that we can't be in true fellowship with God if we aren't in true fellowship with, in community with others. And when we take communion, we're making commitment to closeness and intimacy and unity. When we distance ourselves from others, we distance ourselves from everything. And my prayer for us is then a few minutes as we take communion, we will commit and recommit ourselves to being in a close relationship with anyone that wants to be a part of our church. Whether we are a seasoned believer or a brand new Christ follower with all kinds of baggage, we might, here's what I used to tell everybody when I was, I was a head coach. I successfully worked myself uh, down uh, the chain from college baseball coach to I wound up being an assistant t-ball coach, all right? But I said the same thing to everybody. Not everybody can be a great player, but everybody can be a great teammate. And that's what happens in a church where you're like, yeah, I get it. He reeks of smoke whenever he comes in and stuff like that. He's probably a little bit hungover and stuff like that. But you know what? That's my boy. He's here. He wants to be here. Yes, she runs from relationship to relationship. But you know what? I did the same thing before I came to Jesus and really found out who God created me to be. Guess what that's doing? That's helping us to have a judgment-free society. It's helping us to be able to say, dude, before I go and correct, when I am able, whenever somebody's like, man, what, what do you think's holding me back? Well, I see myself in you as God helped me to get, uh, get free. And so for us to have deep relationships with people, we have to move from I to we where we don't think of ourselves and our comfort first, but how we can bless and help other people. We should be so busy judging ourselves that we don't have time to judge other people. So let's take a few moments to just spend some time with God and check our hearts to prepare us for communion. So our lights are going to go down real quick. And here's what we're going to do. We're just going to spend some time examining our hearts. It's going to be, it's going to be quiet. And we're, going to, we're just going to say, Lord, if there's anything inside of me, that I'm holding back, if there's, if there's something that I'm doing that's not pleasing you, if, there, if I'm holding judgment on somebody, if, if my relationship with my brother or sister in the Lord is being stalled because of my hard-headedness or my lack of forgiveness or because I've just been too judgmental, Lord, just talk to me right now. So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. Father, over these next few moments, we just come before you and we, we boldly approach your throne of grace right now. And Lord, we ask you for your help. We come before you and ask that you would help us in this great passion week. Lord, the very first communion that happened. Lord, we just come and we ask you to help us right now. Lord, help us to, to cleanse ourselves, purify our hearts right now so that not only we can be right with you, but Lord, we can experience what you have for us. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna give these next few moments to you, God. Speak to our hearts, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name. take our elements together I want you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ you've never begun your relationship with God or maybe you one time served God but you've drifted and fallen away and the Holy Spirit's been dealing with you maybe all throughout the service where you're somebody like man it's been like there's this pulling on me that's the Holy Spirit that's the God that created you that wants to have a relationship with you and before we take these communion elements together, you need to surrender your life to Jesus. Now, here's what's going to happen. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going uh, to do anything that would rob you of dignity. All I want to do is have a word of prayer with you so that tonight when you put your head on your pillow, you can know that you are right with God. If that's you, with nobody looking around, you say, Pastor Chad, I'm not right with God. Would you pray for me? Would you just lift up your hand real quick? PC, I'm not right with God. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you, ma'am. Is there anybody else? PC, pray for me. I'm not right with God today, but I want to be right with God today. Those of us with our hands raised, those of us watching outside in our cafe and online, we're all going to pray this prayer together, and you're going to be assured for heaven as if you were already there. Pray this prayer out loud with me, church. Dear Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinner, and I know I'm a sinner, and I've committed sins. But today, Lord Jesus, I give you those sins. I ask you to come into my heart, wash me clean, and I'll live for you as you show me how. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen to me. Some of you just made an important decision and we want to come alongside you and help you to put that, put action to that decision. And whether you raised your hand or not, would you take another step and check that box on your connect card that says, I made a decision today or I recommitted my life to Jesus today. And then put that connect card in the giving box on your way out. Um, and our, our team next week is going to follow up with you and give you some next step information. We also have free resources, a Bible and our Bible basics book. Uh, for you in our next step table as you leave. And here's what we're going to do. I want you to look at this particular passage before we take the elements. It says this, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I love how Jesus puts this. He says, I eagerly desired to do this. There's an intense desire right now for Jesus to be with us in this room. And here's what we got to understand. He longed for community. And if, you, if he longed for community, he was the son of God. How much more important is it for us? We're communal beings. And here's what happens at the table, at the Lord's table. He corrects our issues at the table. Okay? And here's what we can never forget. That Jesus has invited us to sit at his table. Okay? I want you to stand with me. Jesus is about to go through the loneliness of isolation, which is alone, and the loneliness of insulation. What does insulation mean? It means when you're surrounded with people and you still feel like you're alone. And he comes into our insulation and our isolation. He wants to be there. Look what it says here. For I tell you, I'll not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I'll not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. What's Jesus talking about has yet to take place. He's not had communion with his, uh, since this, uh, this last time with his disciples. But ladies and gentlemen, he will have it again, according to Revelations 19, whenever we all have it together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. All right? It says this, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Lord, thank you for helping us to remember. Thank you for helping us to stoke the fire of our relationship with you and remember what you've done for us. Thank you for having your body broken for us thank you that as we take in your bread we become like your word strong and healthy we bless you the Bible says in the same way after the supper he took the cup saying this cup is my new covenant which is in my blood which is poured out for you you know what communion does for those of us with really dramatic past it reminds us that Jesus has a much stronger hold on us than we ever have had on him. And because of the blood that's been shed, when when Satan reminds us of our betrayals and our failure, we choose to remember what Jesus did for us. And because of what he did for us, he purchased our salvation through the shedding of his blood. Let's take the juice together. Father, thank you for the blood that's been shed for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for making us right with God again. Thank you that all of what you've done has led us to this moment right here. Thank you for the closeness we feel with you and with each other. In Jesus' name. Now, church, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're gonna, how we're going to end today. Our prayer team's coming forward, and here's what we're going to learn, okay? 
as they're coming forward, um, we just learned that communion is so important that if we don't do it right, we open ourselves up to sickness and death, right? Okay. Why? Because of the power of the moment. But if the power of the moment is also a, that can bring sickness and death, how much more so that when we do examine our hearts and our lives, it opens us up to what? Healing. We've been praying all week. I really believe that there's going to be some miracles that have been performed in last service and in this service. It's not real popular in American culture right now to talk about the blood that was shed for us. But ladies and gentlemen, it is substitutionary atonement that sets us apart. It's because of the blood that Jesus shed for us. Not only are we right with God, it's because of that same blood that was shed for us that healing has been purchased for you and I. So here's what's going to happen. You and I, when our, when our band begins to play and whenever, uh, whenever our, our worship team begins to sing... We're going to step forward. If you need healing in someone, we're going to pray for people who need healing in their bodies right now. You may need a healing in your marriage. Some of you uh, may be here today and say, I can't get past this bad attitude I'm having. When the team begins to sing, I want you to step into the aisle and have the prayer team pray for you because, ladies and gentlemen, God wants to do something very, very special. He's longed to be here, and he's here right here and right now. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes. I want you to lift up your hands right now, and let's welcome the presence of God here, and let's invite the presence of God to do what only he can do. Father, I thank you for healing bodies. I thank you for restoring marriages. I thank you for fixing broken attitudes. Because of the blood that was shed for us, Lord, I thank you, and I thank you for drawing us to you. In Jesus' name. Won't you step out? If you need healing in some area of your life, step out. We're going to see God do a miracle. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. Lift up your hands with me, church, and let's worship. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. Don't take that sickness home. From the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there. At the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time, I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus.
darkness into glorious light. Now come on, somebody clap your hands and celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. He's an awesome God. Thank you for worshiping with us today, church. Let's continue to worship through our giving as we leave, and we will see you next week for Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. Have an awesome week.